But welcome to my talk, my second ever live talk, very exciting, which is Combating Online Hate and the Gender Critical Movement. Um, so I've just had quite an introduction, but you might be wondering who I am and why I'm here. Um, or like, maybe if you want to put it in a bit more of a polite way, here is Baroness Nicholson of Winterbourne, gender critical activist, uh, saying, and what about this odd woman Katie Montgomery? What has bitten her? So, what has bitten me is, um, I argue on the internet, um, that is why I'm here. Basically, seven years ago, I started disagreeing with transphobic people, and now I'm here. So, don't do that too much or it might happen to you. Um, I'm also a very passionate feminist and LGBT rights activist. Um, I have a number of internet shows, which Gina was very kindly just hyping up for me, where there's, there's a few that are quite alright. Um, I'm also an atheist activist, um, and I'm the host of an atheist calling show called Talk Heathen, and I've also been on some of the other big ones, um, which is quite cool. It's like a good place to go for like, easy arguing compared to the stress of uh, arguing about LGBT rights. Um, I'm also the guitarist in the death metal band, if anyone's interested. Uh, check us out. And I'm also an engineer. Um, my normal job. Um, so yeah, cool. So we're going to be discussing online hate and how to beat it. Um, there is a content warning. We're going to cover some of this stuff. I'll probably mention it. I'm not going to go into horrible, gory detail, but there will be a lot of slurs, but not said by me, so we won't get banned on YouTube. Um, but we'll just be dealing with them in a light-hearted way, I hope. Uh, and, and we're going to end on a positive note, like how to beat this stuff. So. Hopefully it won't be too overwhelming for anyone, but if you need to get up and leave, I won't be offended. If you just think it's rubbish and need to go, I also won't be offended. Um, so an overview of this talk, we're going to be discussing my experiences and then the community experiences of hate. Just say why, like, why I'm even here and why I'm talking about this. Um, and what the effects that has on people, which I think is quite important to emphasize. Um, then we'll be discussing causes and that's largely going to be a discussion of the gender critical movement. Shout out to anyone here. Um, and then we're going to be discussing how to beat it, uh, not just the gender critical movement, but hate in general. Um, so yeah, and because there's a heavy topic, I'm going to break out with cat pictures. This is my cat Poppy. If you stay to the end, her Instagram handle is there. And you can follow her. <laughs> so um, yeah. It, there's, there's like five or six pictures, so it's like the time breaks. It, it'll be fine. Um, but yeah, but she, hopefully she will lighten the mood. So we're going to start off with my experiences. So this is kind of the reason why I feel qualified to be here, although not strictly qualified at all, um, is because I've experienced a lot of hate. I'm a prominent uh, like feminist and LGBT rights activist and trans woman on the internet which, if you are one of those, or you've ever seen one of those, you probably know, get, like, a hilarious amount of hate. Um, I, it's, it's be very accurate to say, someone is writing something about me hateful, like, 24-7, like, constantly. On Twitter, there is someone writing something hateful about me, every single thing I post, every day, just constantly. And uh, so, I feel like that's why, you know, I can discuss that, and we'll go into that in a second. But... I've talked about this quite a lot on YouTube, and I've written it, you know, like, to read and stuff quite a lot, but it is definitely different looking people in the eye and talking about these things. So sorry if it gets a bit awkward, and also, sorry if I'm, like, smiling and talking about these horrible things, but it's kind of my way of dealing with it, but also I've processed a lot of this already, so it's not so stressful for me now. But anyway, here are some of the things I've experienced. Online hate as part of doing activism for trans rights. So I've been doxxed, I've had my personal pictures stolen, I've had death threats, and obviously any death threats are horrible, but there is a, a range, it's like a, you know, like a commissaire of death threats, and this anonymous teenager says, I'm going to kill you or whatever on the internet. They're not nice, but then there's also like, someone leaves multiple 10 minute long voicemails describing how they're going to attack you, or someone from your city says if they ever see you, you won't be able to walk again, that kind of thing. Um, is more stressful. I feel like I've had quite a range of that. Uh, rape threats, obviously. Legal threats. I think one of the most stressful weeks of my life was when um, someone raised tens of thousands of pounds 
uh, in like 24 hours to sue me basically for calling them out on the internet. Um, they didn't go ahead, they wouldn't have got anywhere, but it's still incredibly stressful because the, the numbers involved in the money is, uh, is quite a lot. I've got multiple online stalkers, um, which are horrible. I've been maliciously reported to the police. I've had three lifetime bans from Twitter. Um, you can still follow me on Twitter, I am back. Um, none for hateful conduct or anything. The, like, the first one I ever had was <laughs> discussing the C word with Australians, like some friends, because they obviously use it a little bit different to British people, and they kind of use it just instead of you know every single word. And anyway, I got suspended from that. Um, I've been sent distressing images. In fact, just on the train on the way up here, um, a gender critical man sent me a really gory picture of like a surgery photo of a penis. Uh, disgusting, it just happens all the time. Um, and of course, I've been called every name under the sun, which I've added here. But I feel like a lot of people, especially maybe people who aren't so involved in like minority rights activism, when they think of hate, they kind of just think of being called names. And that, it's not nice to be called names, um, and there are some, you know, very inventive, horrible ways to describe people, but it's, like, the least bad bit out of all of those different things. Um, but we'll get into more of this kind of stuff later, but it's not just me. I, obviously, I'm not unique, well, maybe I'm uniquely hateable, but, um, <laughs> as a, like, being a prominent woman online at all, even if you're not doing politics, you still just get more hate. But this is specifically like a trans thing, as well as you know other minority groups. Um, so just like yeah, in fact, I do consider myself one of the lucky ones because although I am a trans woman on the internet arguing during the trans panic, you know I'm I'm an able person. I'm white. You know, like I have a place to live. I, there are lots of things that could make it a lot harder for me <laughs> because I would get a lot more abuse if I wasn't you know who I am. And, um, you know, these, it's intersectional, this abuse, and it does stack up. And it's way, you know, I, I guess it's easier for me than for many to do this kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't think I'm, you know, special in the fact that I've been hated upon or anything. It, it's very common for a lot of people. Um, but here's some horrible statistics. So this first one is from Gallup, just the most recent Gallup um, poll. It said 60% of trans people online have faced abuse. But I feel like, I'm kind of surprised it's not 100, uh, but maybe this covers people who don't go on the internet, or just came out, or don't like to consider themselves as an, a victim of abuse, and that kind of thing. But interestingly, the same study says 50% of trans people have experienced abuse from a transphobic activist, uh, which I feel like is their code for gender critical, um, which is, that seems reasonable. I think like half of all trans people have probably been targeted. Um, it doesn't take long if you make an account and make it seem. Oh, I guess stealth people will probably be, a, you know, they'll avoid some of it and stuff. But um, yeah, forty-one percent of trans people have experienced a hate crime, which is a horrific statistic. That's actually the lower of the two estimates. That's the Stonewall estimate. The, the Gallup one is like sixty uh, percent or something. Um, I think when like the media and opponents of trans rights like to portray us talking about hate crimes as like, oh, someone misgendered you once on the internet, and now that's suddenly a hate crime, and they're arresting a mother of four while she's cooking dinner. Um, but when I'm talking about hate crimes, I experienced a hate crime, uh, the last one was in 2019, and it was a situation where I had to, well, we basically ran for our safety, uh, me and another trans woman, and, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that, people are talking about, that list I just gave. So I guess I want to highlight that this name-calling thing is it's such a minor thing, it happens to trans people so much that it's not a big deal in terms of, well, it's a massive deal, but it's compared to what we're discussing when we're talking about hate crimes. Um, anyway, sorry, didn't explain this before. Um, but according to um, Brandwatch, 15% of all internet comments about trans people are hateful. Compared to the, the baseline, which is 1% of all internet comments uh, estimated in several different studies, um, are abusive just between people. So that goes from like being 1 in 100 to 1 in 7 for trans people, the comments that you experience. So you can see why 
um, trans people might get this kind of they, they feel a lot more hated on the internet because you just encounter it so much more. Even if it's not being targeted for you, you know, every single comedy has some garbage thing, you know, every single newspaper article is about it, it's just relentless. Um, I've included this, this is mainly a talk about online discrimination and hate, but I just wanted to put in some examples of some real life stuff just to highlight that this isn't all just internet abuse. The internet abuse is horrible. Um, and it can be really serious, as we'll mention some later. Um, but also, just to highlight, so 43% of UK employers say that they might not hire a trans. Um, you know, it's this stuff is so extreme. Sixty-six percent of trans of trans people have been sexually assaulted, including myself. And that's another one that I feel like how was it not higher? But uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that there are people who escaped there. Um, and thirty-six, so over a third of trans uni students have experienced negative comments from staff. Like, how are you supposed to get good education um, when the people who are meant to be teaching you are uh, saying abusive things? I, yeah, ridiculous. So, thank you very much for the university comments to me. Um, but it isn't just, this stuff isn't just safety concerns, and it isn't just feeling sad. Like, if someone says something horrible about you, horrible about you, you have a bad day, and I think a lot of people just imagine, like, oh yeah, you know, I've, I've had a situation where someone says something horrible to me online, and I, you know, I got over it and stuff. But when it is relentless, um, it can actually affect your brain, it can change your brain structure. And like LGBT people in particular <coughs> experience trauma from like adolescence onwards and sometimes younger. Um, it's very common, I mean certainly growing up in the Section 28 era, to just, there'd be like no breaks on the sort of abuse of LGBT people from like the age of 10 or 11, as kind of the first time I started encountering it. Um, and this relentless abuse shapes who you are as you grow up. And constant trauma can, you know, causes your brain to produce chemicals like cortisol, for example, and that affects multiple parts of your brain. Um, and the, this constant trauma can cause damage to your amygdala and hippocampus and all these different parts. And like something I've experienced myself is this hypersensitivity where I've had phases. And I'm lucky I've managed to get out of it, but I guess the first times that I was getting to a point where I was getting like constant hate, um, it built up my like anxiety, and I just had this like base level of panic, where even if I wasn't online and I was with friends and I was distracted doing something else, if just something small happened, I'd instantly go into fight or flight mode, um, and and you know this is the result of constant trauma changing your brain, and I think. As well, obviously, this is most um, damaging for young people whose brains are still developing. So, online hate, um, it, it's more than just a bad day when someone says something horrible to you, even especially when it's like you know 15 times more likely for trans people, it's also causing you know damage to people's brains. So, here's um, a guy from Chicago University who says. Research has indicated that repeated exposure to traumatic events can lead to persistent and lifelong maladaptive coping mechanisms with specific impairment related to the control of one's cognitive processing, reading skills, and problem solving. So even from, like, even if you don't care about LGBT people, we are like 5% of the country, and if, if we're having our, our like, you know, it's kind of like a form of damage to your brain, which can affect your problem solving, that is bad for society. For you to allow this abuse to go on to LGBT people damages people around you and makes society worse for everyone. So it's, this is more than just personal. Like This stuff is, is I'm trying to hammer home how important combating hatred is. Um, but anyway, those are quite heavy. Here is our first like cat break, to, or second cat break, to um, that's the, that's the worst part of talking about hate overall. 
here is Poppy on Christmas eating a Tesco Zone salt and vinegar chips dip. Um, she, she quite enjoys them. Um, so I think another reason why I kind of feel qualified to be here, I know, um, is that I, I feel like I can handle this stuff quite well. I was just saying about how I went through a kind of panic stage early on, but I feel like I've learned to deal with the amount of hatred that I get quite well. And I, literally, I think every day, I get a comment from, you know, a message from someone saying, how do you handle this much abuse from people? Um, and it does break a lot of people. You know, it, it's broken me in the past. <clears throat> so I feel like I can explain, I'm not a qualified psychologist, I'm not a therapist, but I can explain what I do to handle you know, this, this constant like, onslaught, which may help you, hopefully. <clears throat> so the first thing I do the, is make sure that I address what is being said about me or to me rationally. Because it's very easy to let your emotions respond to it, and I think that's totally normal. And you shouldn't punish yourself if your emotions do respond to something someone says. If someone says you're disgusting for being a trans person, or you know, you're a child predator, or all the normal things they say about us all the time, it can make you feel horrible, but it can also make you feel like, make you doubt yourself. You know, what if they're true and, and your emotions can kind of carry you on this, especially if you, know, you get a huge internet pile on with like 250 people. The worst one I ever had was actually 12,000 people uh, when I said the Yorkie Bar advert was sexist. Um, bad day. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, I won't go off on that. But um, when they say something like this, it, it can be very easy to just kind of ride it. Uh, emotionally, but it's best. The first thing I do is even sometimes say it out loud, like, is this true? Is this a fact? Do they have any evidence of this? Is this logically consistent? And the answer is, I mean, when it's hate, it's always no. And when you start feeling bad, you can say, it's okay for me to feel bad, but rationally, this emotion is like wrong. It's, it, it's incorrect. Um, and, and that really does help me handle it. Um, and the second thing, is to like get perspective. Like it can feel overwhelming as a trans person, or in any you know any LGBT person or any minority to feel like there are so many people who are dedicated to ruining your ruining your life. Like there are people. This is their hobby. This is like their what they do after work. They campaign to take away trans people's rights. They just go online and find pictures of you and you know. God, they have a forum where they just like laugh at trans people's surgery photos and stuff. Like, it's it's overwhelming just thinking about how much hate there is for you. But the thing is, people hate all kinds of fucking stupid stuff. I am a woman who can drive, and that means there are like millions of people on Earth who hate me for that. Like, I'm an atheist. Some countries have the death penalty for, for atheists, and so they hate atheists. You know, there are so many things about you that people hate. Um, and it, you don't worry about those things every day. Or there, I hope there are some things about you. I hope there are some things about you that are hated that you don't worry about. I know, but there are things that, that aren't constantly on your mind in the same way that I find trans issues are. And I remind myself that. And I also, like, imagine if you take something about yourself which is just an observable fact, but isn't socially controversial. Like, for example, I am right-handed. Imagine if you discovered this online forum with like 15,000 members who were dedicated to ruining the lives of right-handed people. And they have this whole big thing like, being right-handed is a fetish. And like, they post pictures of right-handed people like, look, they're holding it with the left hand, but I bet they're faking it. They're a secret right-handed. Like, if someone then came up to you in the street and they're like, you're a fucking right-handed, disgusting. You'd just be like, what? Like, what are you on about? And that is, that there's no difference between someone hating on you for being trans and someone hating on you for being right-handed. Like, rationally, there's no difference between those things. And just try and get in the mindset. Imagine, rather than them attacking you for something which you've been brought up to believe, you know, can, you know, is shameful and you, society does attack you for it. Just be like, okay, I'm imagining instead they're attacking me. Having another thing, I have straight thumbs. Not many people have straight thumbs. Straight thumb supremacy. No. Um, if you got a curved thumb, I fucking hate you. So it's just it's just stupid. Um, 
very important, I think, is to not do this alone. It, I found in lockdown, when I was on my own, it was so easy to run away with, like, worrying about things, because there was no one there to ground me. And I actually kind of have three different ways of connecting with people to deal with this. I post about it online, and that is actually the main thing that I was... I like arguing with people, I'm kind of addicted to arguing, but also just venting. When someone writes this, like, insane nine-tweet monologue about your genitals, sometimes you just have to post it and be like, everyone else sees this right, this is fucking insane, right? And then people are like, oh, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen, and it brings you down to earth. Um, but I also have close friends who are, you know, do LGBT rights stuff, or are just LGBT themselves, and they've experienced it, or they've seen people experiencing it, and it means you can, like, bomb with them, like, oh, you know, you've had it before, where someone's tried to do this, and they're like, yeah, I know that, and that can make you feel like you're not going for it alone. And last of all, I have um, friends, like, in my sort of real life, day-to-day -day stuff, who aren't hyper online like I am, and it's good to have people like that. They care about friends' rights, they care about me as a person, but they're not in the trenches on the front lines. They don't know who Graham Linehan is, they don't care, and it, I think it's really good to just escape from this. And I find that, um, you know, one of the, if I have a whole week where people are saying that, you know, all oh, women hate trans people, and like, no one's ever going to love you, and stuff, and then I go to the pub on Friday, and then I just talk to random people, and everyone's just kind of nice, and it, it brings you back to real life. Um, and one thing on this escape it thing is, I think this is the last thing it took me to learn out of all of these. Um, because I'm the kind of person who, when there's a problem, and someone's like, oh, you know, just, just don't think about it, go to something else. I'm like, no, because that won't solve the problem. If someone is, pub, you know, putting my address online or something, it doesn't solve the problem by me going away. So then I just attack it more and more and more, and lean more and more into it. But the thing is, having a break isn't just you know, it's not like, oh, you can solve it by running away from it. What it is, is it's letting your brain reset, and it's letting you have more of a fresh mind, and lets you, um, you know, focus on it more, and it stops you from being tired out. So that's, that's why having a break is important. And this is a quote from Munro Bogdoff. So Munro is more prominent than me, so she obviously gets more abuse from that. Um, but she's also a model, and I feel like at least some models seem to get a lot more abuse from certain men. And she's also black, so she also gets so much racism. Like, I feel like maybe she even gets more racism than trans stuff, because she once did an interview where she said racism's bad, and people fucking hate for that. And she said, you have to be dead inside not to let it bother you, and it's made even harder when you experience it all the time, and the people perpetrating it don't seem to be sanctioned for their behaviour. I have totally given up on the idea that any trans people will ever face any consequences for what they do. Um, I think if you're holding out for that, you're just going to get hurt. Um, that isn't going to happen. How we are going to win as trans people is these obs insane obsessed trans folks are going to get bored of it, get old, lose the media's attention. <coughs> they're not going to change, they're not going to stop, they're not going to face any consequences. And we are just going to slowly get more rights, and slowly get more freedom from them. So I think that's how you should look at this going ahead. Uh, and not feel like there's something that, you know, like... Sorry, I shouldn't mention Graham and Hunt twice, and have a really good day, but he keeps talking about the, the day when trans people will be vanquished and everything will be back to normal. Uh, that isn't going to happen. That's, that's how cold to select the world. So there are... So, I feel like I'm very desensitised to it. Like, Monroe was just saying about how, you know, you have to be dead inside to not let it affect you, and that is true. Sometimes it gets to me. Um, uh, not that frequently, I'm not bulletproof, I'm quite well armoured to it, but I'm very desensitised to it. And I think that uh, there are pros and cons to being desensitised to it. The main pros are it helps me survive, as I've just been explaining. <clears throat> but it also helps me be able to understand it. Like, if you see someone being transphobic to you, almost as like a dog barking at you, that's just what dogs do, um, then you're more able to study it and understand it, which then helps you combat it. And I feel like that's why I'm able to be here, is that I'm so desensitized to this stuff. I'm just, I feel like David Attenborough watching the people say abusive things about me. The, content, the main con, I think, is when you're super desensitized, 
it can super freak out, especially cis people. Like your friends who aren't like into it. Like I had an incident the other day when um, I was just with some of my <coughs> friends and everyone there, everyone else there is cis person, and I got this comment. It was fucking weirdo writing this like. Imagine what my genitals were like, and written this big long description of it. And I just thought it was hilarious. And I was like, ha, this, this guy's just written this fucking monologue about, you know, my genitals. Um, and my friends are like, oh, let's hear it. And I read it out, and they looked like they were going to cry. And like, they're like, it's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard in my life. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's so weird, it's just kind of funny. Um, but yeah, no, you are right, it's fucking horrific. it. But, yeah. Um, and the other one we've already mentioned is it can change your brain. I mean, I don't know how much my brain has changed. Um, I don't know. Made me into even more of a dickhead, but it's vibing. But it does allow you to do this. So, this is... <laughs> Sorry for anyone who's not really concerned. This, this is why it's good to be Sense. We can laugh at their stupid words for us. This is all the slurs that I can think of. You get one point for everyone you've ever been called. Um, I think my score is 23. I haven't ever been called a he, she, or a shim. So if anyone wants to call me a shim afterwards, <laughs> I'll take it off. Um, I, like, I feel like gender bend was really old school. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've sorted them into groups um, based on who, where I think these have come from. There's a lot of overlap. Um, but yeah, you know, if you want to see this, this is a, see lots of people on Twitter. This is on uh, Katie Shit Cartoons on Twitter. If you are, if you are interested. But I recently, so these are like the, I feel like the five traditional groups of transphobes. But I recently got into transvestigators, and I fucking love transvestigators. <laughs> and I've discovered the slurs EGI, which stands for Elite Gender Invert, and uh, flip flop, which I think is a slur for like a couple, where it's like a trans man and a trans woman. Um, but usually they pick like, you know, um, Michelle and Barack Obama, they're flip flops because they're both secretly trans or whatever. Um, anyway, it's, it's quite fun sometimes. But maybe you didn't enjoy it and you just need a drink, like probably. Like, day, looking at slurs, like true. I can't believe they call us trunes, it's so embarrassing. Imagine saying that to your friends, like, oh yeah, I'm putting on the internet, taking a piss of trunes, and they're just like, Okay. <laughs> but where does all this on my hate come from? So this is what I'm going to talk about, the gender critical movement. Really, I, I do want to emphasize though, that online hate isn't just from the gender critical movement. And while the, like, the, the media is attacking us and uses their narratives a lot, and that there are a lot of gender critical people in the British media, um, so many, there are so many fucking columnists I need to learn the names of who I could not be bothered with otherwise. Um, but they're not the ones who are in charge in government. Like, obviously, it's Conservative government. Um, there are some gender critical people in the Conservative Party, but it's not the majority of it. And they're just kind of using it as a, a tool to get people to vote right wing. Um, but I thought this was very interesting. I asked this poll, um, and it's a very UK phenomenon. Uh, so obviously, like in the USA, it's mainly Republicans and then QAnon people and all those kind of wackos. Whereas here, I feel like gender critical is the the majority. And I think if you're a British trans person or someone who's ever once said that you don't mind trans people existing, then you probably have a pile on on some kind of social media. And when you click on the profiles of the people doing it, they're all hashtag sex not gender, and, and you know, you once you see their like calling cards. There are, no one is just a little bit gender critical. You're either fucking all in or you're normal. Um, but, so I just, I guess I want to focus on the gender critical movement for a couple of reasons. And one is that I feel like, at least in the UK, the re like, Republican position of, yeah, let's just eliminate trans people, wipe them out completely. And they'll just say that on TV, like, oh, I think we should start having LGBT people or something. They'll say that on TV. And people here know that's fucking garbage and it wouldn't fly in the Houses of Parliament, for now at least, um, and I don't think you could get away with saying that at university, whereas I think the gender critical narrative very much can be said on the media, can be said in Parliament, can be said at university, and most people don't realise why it is so bad. Um, so that's why I'm kind of focusing on this, to expose these arguments, and because that really is where just most of the online thing comes from. 
Um, so but anyway, if you don't know what gender critical is, this is kind of a reasonable summary of them. I think if you ask them, I think the, the main thing they would argue is that sex is binary and immutable. And that's like what, what uh, May Forstater argued in, um, in court and one with defending this position as the gender critical position. Um, they often say, like, well, you can got basic biology, whatever that means. It's a very common thing for them to say. Uh, they absolutely fucking love definitions. Until you open the wrong dictionary and it doesn't say what they want. But adult human female is one of their like, calling cards. And they were maybe less now, but like they used to say they were feminists all the time. And I think there were a lot who still see themselves as feminists or still introduce themselves as that. But a lot of the kind of bigger ones have kind of given up on it now and it's folded in a lot more conservative, particularly conservative men who you know, they were all part of Gamergate and they fucking hated feminists and then suddenly like, oh it's changed, we all pretended to be feminists now, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, that's, that's generally how you would see this. And the thing is, with this, and this is kind of a key theme of the gender critical movement, is if you step back from the context of trans rights and you just looked at this literally, you would just be like, okay, I mean, I guess biology's alright, I, I mean, sex isn't binary and immutable, but like, I don't really care if you think that, and I guess, like, I mean, I quite like women's rights, so, okay. Um, so is it really a hate movement? Um, I'm, I'm going to attempt to <laughs> fully substantiate that claim, that it is a hate movement. So, I'm going to start here with an example. So this is a thing called the WDI Declaration. I guess that's a bit like pin number because it stands for Women's Declaration International and then I call it WDI Declaration. Anyway, WDI are one of the bigger gender critical groups in the UK. Um, this declaration is a public declaration that anyone can sign or any organisation can sign up to and it has 34,000 signatures and 470 organisations. So this is quite big. This, I'm not trying to say that this isn't like you know, talking about Christians and then all Catholics and pointing at the Pope, and he is like the kind of the de facto leader. WDI are not, they're not even the biggest um, organ gender critical organization, but they are still a big deal, and a lot of people have signed up to this. This declaration is public, and it calls to remove basically all trans rights. It calls to ban all trans women and girls without exception from all women's spaces without exception, including toilets, changing rooms. Everything it calls to remove protections from misogyny for trans women. Um, it one just pointlessly cruel. It calls to uh, record trans women and girls rape victims as male uh, in order to hide the fact that misogyny is a component in these crimes. Um, but you know it, it feels like pointlessly malicious for some of this stuff. Um, they of course also legally protect parents who put their kids through conversion therapy because they don't believe that trans kids, kids exist. And of course they call to ban all healthcare for trans people under 18, um, which is very extreme. They, so another point I guess I want to highlight being here at the university and also the context of academic freedom, which is going to come up a little bit more later, is this declaration calls to ban research into trans women getting pregnant. Now I don't think this is it's not something like super close that's going to happen. There's probably not many people researching this. But it's an explicit call to ban a type of academic freedom. And this declaration also calls to ban any organization that believes in gender identity, which, by the way, is like the NHS, the WHO, like every single major medical organization in the world. They want to ban them from having any influence on trans healthcare at all. So this is this declaration is not compatible with <clears throat> academic freedom. We'll cover this more. But like, who has signed this? Because this is just one declaration, but this is so, like, this is such a common thing for people to have signed. Like, most of the time when I look up some gender critical person, they're on this fucking list. We're not going to go through the names of individuals, but so many other groups have signed this as well. Get the Out, the ones uh, that did the BBC article about how trans women are raping lesbians, um, object, uh, Wolf, this like kind of uh, American one, um, Posey Parker's organisation, Standing for Women, LGB Alliance, probably one of the biggest gender critical organisations, for women's Scots, your local hate group, Labour um, <laughs> <laughs> Women's Declaration, uh, Safe Schools Alliance, just some conservative group that somehow gender critical, transgender trend, 
women's rights network, Spinster, Over It, Wild Women Workshop, which is one that J.K. Rowling constantly promotes. Like, there are so many gender critical organizations that have signed up for this, and so many individuals. In fact, on my YouTube channel, um, there's a video of me confronting Dr. Kathleen Stock on this. Um, like, she was doing her kind of like, oh, I just have concerns about men in women's spaces. And I said, but you signed this declaration calling to ban all trans women from all women's spaces. She's like, oh, I don't really care about toilets, and oh, I, I, I don't mind about real, true transsexuals who have transitioned. And I was like, well, okay, but you have signed this declaration. Would you be prepared at least to say that part of it you don't agree with, or you regret that part, or you think this declaration is actually too extreme? And of course she's not, because she does, you know, she's signed up to this declaration. Um, this is a, I feel like this sums up the gender critical beliefs. I think that if you ask someone to say their views, a gender critical person, they will um, avoid it and say, oh, I just have concerns. And, uh, but if you hand them down and keep going for months, maybe weeks, hours, days, whatever it takes to get them to actually just agree to a position, these are the positions they will take. And there's some, there'll be, of course, there'll be some, there's some who will say, oh, I, I don't think we should ban healthcare for all under 18s, or, or we don't need to ban trans women from the toilets, but the majority of those positions are held by the majority of gender critical people, are, in my experience. Um, but it's not just WI, they're not the only one. Though, um, WDI did write this, if you haven't read it, it's worth reading, absolutely fucking wacky. Um, for the first of three consultations for the Gender Recognition Act reform, they wrote this thing saying that trans people were the product of sissy hypno porn um, and all this other kind of weird stuff. But they uh, said that, so there's this thing, um, the oh, it's C E W D A W, I can't remember what it is now off the top of my head, but there's basically some international declaration trying to eliminate things, violence against women. Um, and it's a very good declaration. I guess this is what WDI is in the style of. Um, but they basically say we should eliminate all things that cause harm against women. And WDI argue that transgenderism is something that does that, so that needs to be eliminated. And like in a similar vein, Janice Raymond is one of the like OG um, gender criticals before they were calling themselves gender criticals, who in her uh, book. Um, Transsexual Empire, um, it's a good title, 1979 actually, so really ahead of the curve, um, she said, the problem of transsexualism is best served by morally mandating it out of existence, so that sounds it's pretty good, um, of course, uh, probably one of the most prominent gender critical people today is uh, Kelly J. Keane or Lucy Parker, she's, I mean, picking a quote from her, which is extreme, it's, there's a lot to choose from. She's, um, she said on Twitter that she thinks all trans men should be sterilized. She, she's also the lady who said that um, she thinks men with guns should go into women's toilets to intimidate trans women. Um, pretty crazy. Julia Long, uh, she's less relevant now. Um, I guess she's, she's kind of more of the, um, I don't know how to describe it, cutting edge people. You know, she says the most extreme stuff. She, uh, the LGBT Alliance Conference, 2020. Um, stood up and said, first she said that she doesn't think there's any such thing as a good trans person, and then that she said she doesn't think there are any trans people at all. To the whole room applauding. Um, you know, no one called her out for that. Our duty are kind of a smaller gender critical group, but they've said that they want to target 100% desistance, and for anyone who doesn't know, desistance is like convincing someone out of transitioning. Um, they're kind of just talking about kids here, but also our duty are one of the ones who are saying they should be trans healthcare for up to 25s, so where to stop. And of course the Helen Joy speech is probably one of the most recent extreme examples where um, she said some, you know, she did this monologue and she said that uh, we have to reduce the number of trans people who transition and she specifically said including those who are happily and unhappily transitioned um, because we're all damaged and a huge problem to a sane world. So like these views are so extreme and they're so common. Like Helen Joyce is another very prominent and critical person um, who I won't say any more about because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> yeah. um, but th these views are so common and if you were to just meet a random and critical person and say like, do you agree with this person when they say this? 
Do you agree with the WDI declaration? Do you agree with this other group, which constantly works with all of these people and WDI? You know, do you agree? J.K. Rowling's constantly promoting people from all these various groups and stuff. Do you just disagree with them at least? And um, you won't get them to say it, not publicly. They wouldn't be able to say, I think the WDI declaration is extremist when it tries to ban all trans women and girls, even from the toilet. That is too far for me. They won't say that. You won't get them to say it. And I've, I have tried, I have talked to, I've tried making friends with gender critical people, I've tried being confrontational, I've tried being friendly, I've tried absolutely everything for years. I've talked to some gender critical people every day for months, humanising myself in an attempt to just get them to agree that some of this stuff isn't maybe the best. Uh, and you just can't do it. But this, I think, is so, like, this stuff is so extreme. How do they get away with it? And the reason is, is because when they go in the media, they don't say this stuff out loud. If they went and said, oh yeah, well of course my goal is to ban all trans women and girls from all women's spaces and who's in the toilets, as like the opening line, they know it sounds bad. It, it sounds bad. Um, so instead they'll just say they have concerns about men in women's spaces. And that opens the conversation up a bit more, because then people who have no idea what's going on will be like, oh yeah, I don't want men in the women's toilets. I mean, I don't want men in the women's toilets, so that's a kind of reasonable position. And it's using these things called dog whistles or dog whistle politics. And it's basically where you say what you don't say what you think, you don't say what you're trying to communicate directly, you come up with some other phrase which everyone who's on your side knows. They know what it means. And everyone who you're targeting knows what it means too. So for example, if you went into the toilet here and you saw a sticker that said sex matters on it, if you're a trans person, you would know that's a gender critical person who's gone in there and stuck it up to intimidate you. You know about it. If you're a gender critical person, you're like, ah, oh, someone else has been here already. I know this, you know, I know what this phrase means. But most people will be like, sex matters, I, I guess I like having sex, I mean, I don't really care, they probably wouldn't even clock what this means, and that's what these dog whistles are about. Um, and the key things are this, is you always have plausible deniability, you can always back off when you think that it looks bad for you, and you can always frame your opponents as hyperbolic and hysterical, and this happens to me so often, and it is so infuriating. I will say something like, oh, you know, gender criticals want to ban me from the toilets at work, and I'm like, oh, you're so over the top, you're so crazy, oh, Katie Montgomery, she just says anything. And then I'll say, well, look, okay, here's this declaration, here's the person who signed it, do you agree that, or not that this is what is being said? And they're like, I'm no longer going to reply to you. Um, it, it's very infuriating, and it's just because they know it just looks bad. I, I don't have to hide anything I want. I just say what my demands are as a trans person, um, I don't need codes for any of that. And the other thing that I think helps them a lot is the progressive framing. And I think this is a general pattern we're seeing with conservatives in general, um, kind of the world over, including in the USA as well, um, which is where they're kind of using the language of the previous decade or so, like progressive movements, and turning it around. And like a good example is My Body, My Choice, which has been like a feminist slogan for abortion for a long time, and suddenly all the anti-vaxxers are saying it. And like, it's uh, bad faith using an argument that people have kind of already accepted and trying to use it um, for something else. And obviously, gender critical, at least a lot in 2016, let's say now, sort of put itself forward as a feminist movement. Um, and there are still some people who like have a feminist history in the movement. Um, and that confuses people who don't know. And, and like, if you're a random cis person, especially if you're a cis man, and you've got a trans person saying, you know, this person is transphobic, and then the other person said, no, I just care about women's rights, you're like, okay, I don't want to hurt trans people, I don't want to hurt women, I don't want to get involved in this, I'll just leave them to it. And then that benefits them, because then they get to do their hate speech stuff, and people aren't really taking that seriously. Um, but I also think one of the most important things of this is it lets them convince themselves that it's a good thing. So, as I was saying, I have talked, I have you know, made friends with gender critical people before, um, including some of the bigger names, and like talked to them for you know months. And more than once, I've got to the position where I've said, you know, like I I don't need need you to say this for all trans people. I don't need need you to make any general statement. 
totally in private, I'm not going to screenshot this, I'm not going to record it. Do you still want to ban me from the toilets at work? Like, is that a thing you actually want? And several times, I can think of three occasions particularly, where they said, well, I'm really sorry, and it makes me feel really bad to say it, but yes. And I think, you know, in that situation, they know it's bad, but obviously that's what their belief is. But then they can, they can they're probably in a situation where they're like, well, I'm telling my friend I want to, you know, mess her life up. Mess her life up. Um, <laughs> but at least if they say, oh, okay, well, it's for the greater good, this is for the rights of women, then, it, you know, you can kind of cast away this responsibility and bad feelings. Um, and this, there's another cartoon on the room, as you can see from the artwork, it's pretty stellar. Um, I think a lot of people think that the only three people in existence, the only three types of people, are the first three. So there's people who are openly pro-trans rights, um, there are the people, like, sorry, more slurs, but like, that's, they're just so funny. Like, <laughs> lady boys are such a stupid slur. Um, and, and also, like, as an engineer and a guitarist, Tranny has like three people. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said any of the stuff. Sorry, if you get mad from YouTube, whoever's hosting this. Um, so, like, these people, I don't care about. But like, if they're going to say something rude or crude or, like, say some slur, they don't really mean it, and they're not trying to take away my human rights, yeah, I'd rather they didn't, like, read a book. But, like, okay. And the, the people who are just calling themselves and want to ruin our lives, you know, the kind of, like, Westboro Baptist Church types, they are grim. Like, definitely bad, but I still don't think they're as bad as the people who have the same beliefs as them, but hide it, and try and act as they're like the first person on the left. And they're like, oh yeah, of course I support trans rights. I just have some concerns. And then after talking to them for like three months, you get to the bottom and it turns out they've already signed the WDOA declaration, they've been lying the whole time. It's very tedious. Um, so maybe this bit's gonna be a bit controversial. If you don't have gender critical colleagues or friends, they're probably nice to you, that's fine. I'm sure lots of them are very nice people, if you're a cis person. But I just ask them, like, do, do you agree with this declaration? Um, like, do you condemn these people saying these really extreme things? <coughs> are you able to publicly say that you don't think this is good, or this person's an extremist, or...? Well... If you are willing to say that you think the whole declaration is a load of garbage and you know these people are really extreme and all this kind of stuff, then what makes you gender critical? Like if you don't if you don't want to ruin trans people's lives, why why are you calling yourself gender critical? Why are you giving your clearly better position and your credibility to the rest of these people? And if you can't condemn it, well then there you go. Now you know what they stand for. Um, but you don't have to get in confrontations with people if you don't want to. Um, anyway, here's Poppy again, in a box. <laughs> Yay, she's lovely. Um, so, how do we beat hate? Um, the first thing I think is recognising it and not letting people get away with dog whistles and calling out to people who don't understand them. Um, so I've got some examples here, for example, like these are all classic gender critical things like sex matters, they just mean your birth sex. Homosexual means same sex attracted. I need to explain this because I know this one. This is one of their favorite ones. Is what they actually mean is when they say it to me, they're saying, it is gay men who are attracted to you and not straight men. That, that is like what is being said. They think sexuality is just based on your birth sex. Now obviously in how real life works, the thing is when they say homosexual means same sex attracted and you're like, you know they're gender critical, so you react to like, oh, fuck off. And then they say, ah, oh, you must be homophobic. And they can show to everyone else, and everyone else is like, well, that is what it means, isn't it? And like, yeah, it is. That is what it means, unless you have some belief that someone has basically like a sex essence that they were given a conception, which is really what you're attracted to. It's like, um, though I did have a guy yesterday say that he could smell chromosomes, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I know. But um, defend women's sports. None of the people who say defend women's sports give a flying fuck about women's sports. They don't care about funding issues or coaches sexually assaulting girls into, you know, um, athletics and stuff. They don't care. What they mean is, I don't want trans women playing football at the park. Um, the classic adult human female. 
uh, just means trans women to have rights. Um, he presents sequence of lots of these, like he defends sex-based rights. <clears throat> they like to frame it as though they're the ones on the defense. They're the ones trying to protect and save quo. But like, for something like protect single-sex spaces, trans women have used women's spaces since you know, longer than anyone here has been alive. That's the status quo. We've had legal protection to do so since 1999. So when they're saying protect single sex spaces, I mean, protect, you're not protecting what we already have, you're protecting this thing that you've decided is how it should be. So actually, it's not protecting you are the aggressor if you're trying to change things and take away people's rights. Um, like, you know, exploratory therapies and classics, like version therapy, watchful waiting, that's also another similar one. Um, so, the next most important thing, I think, once you've called it out and shown people what everyone's actually said, I would just wish everyone would just say their beliefs up front, it would just be so much easier. Um, it's to, education does make a big difference. I won't go into this loads, but um, contact theory uh, is, there was studies, and guy came up with this idea that um, just by exposure to people, um, you're more likely to be tolerant of them and treat them like other people. And they did this study, like one of the original ones was, they got a bunch of uh, Catholic cis boys, because every study is just on cis boys and men, um, and they just split them arbitrarily, arbitrarily into two groups and had them camp in different places, and they did like challenges, and just from being separate, being pitted against each other in like friendly challenges, they got really like violent and they started vandalizing, seeing each other's camps and like being really horrible to each other, and then when they put them all together for a little while and made them camp together and work on a task together, the hate all just went away. Uh, but this has been verified like loads, like hundreds of studies, um, and showing that it, like originally the first one was to uh, to uh, stop for racism, but they've shown that it's true for like all kinds of things, including sexism, which is really interesting. There was um, one study I was reading where they had some schools, and they basically got the teachers to not use gendered language, but to just highlight the fact that kids were girls or boys. So they would say good boy or good girl, or they would call, get all the girls to sit on one side and all the boys to sit on the other side, and that kind of thing. And just highlighting what they were caused sexism in those classes to increase because people realized that they were in a group and then they learned what the stereotypes of those groups were and they learned the hierarchy from just having the existence of it reinforced to them all the time. Um, so this is how I think gay people won gay marriage and kind of won against the gay panic like you know, 20 or 30 years ago was just what I know. Like when you get to the point where most people know a gay person and they're just a normal person, then it's so much harder to hate them. It's so much harder to believe all this garbage propaganda. Um, and that is how trans people get away long term. Uh, it's just going to be another decade, yeah. Um, but here's an example. This is a study that actually the BBC commissioned, and they never published this bit because the BBC doesn't like trans people. Um, but, I mean, it's quite clear here that if you don't know anything about trans rights, then um, you're, you know, you, I mean, this is, all these numbers are quite depressing, but you're about as likely to want to ban me from the toilet at work as you are to not. Um, but if you know trans people, if you know about trans rights, or if you're related to one, then massively the support for trans people using, or trans women using weapons facilities, um, it makes a difference. There's another can. So by the way, pro tip, as well if you follow Poppy on Instagram, hashtag cats in sinks, it's a good hashtag, um, it's quite fun. Also cats on glass tables, they like up underneath, it always feels a bit violating, but it's a good um, Now this is a controversial one, deplatforming. So, deplatforming, is it controversial? Well, so, there was a thing a while ago <laughs> at this university where some gender critical people wanted to watch a gender critical film. And uh, basically, there was a protest and they managed to block them. And some of the people involved in that might be in the audience right now. Shout out to them. Um, and so, they got deep <laughs> Um and the Edinburgh Academics for Academic Freedom Twitter account was not happy that I got to do a talk and they didn't get to watch their film. Um, they, uh, the framing of gender critical people as hateful is aggressive. Like, if you're not hateful, 
then it won't happen. No, but I feel like this kind of um, this is the kind of thing that they try and get away with by saying like, oh, it's so ridiculous. Katie is going out of her way to paint us as aggressors and be horrible. But like the stuff we just looked at from this WGI declaration and, and other things, um, how how could you not describe this as hateful? Um, I just think that's a completely reasonable description of the situation. But they don't want to be associated with it because it's really important for like the propaganda of the gender critical movement. Um, I <laughs> sorry, this is quite funny. Um, but so I guess one of the main things here is they're trying to make this an academic freedom thing. Um, but and so we'll come on to more. I think it's the next one. Um, no. Okay, so. They, there's this kind of idea that the more people you let talk, the more academic freedom you have. If you let everyone talk, you have all the academic freedom, and that just isn't true. If you have a university where you constantly are inviting misogynistic dickheads to come and talk about how women are inferior, and how they shouldn't even be at university, and they shouldn't be able to drive, and all this kind of stuff, of course women academics are going to be able to participate in um, you know, they're not going to feel safe to participate in the conversation, they're not going to feel free to be, uh, you know, at lectures and stuff, and of course it's going to reduce their, um, you know, wants to participate. Is there somebody uh, chairing this event? Anyway, um, so I'm going to give an example, well actually I just want to finish the point of if you allow hate to speak then people will be intimidated out of contributing and if you silence hate, silence is the word they like to use, but if you just stop hate being spread then people in minority groups are more free to um, talk and say their mind and it brings more academic freedom. Um, but I do want to give an example of when Deplatforming, I think, is unambiguously good. Um, so, for an example, Kiwi Farms. Kiwi Farms is a stalking website. Um, it's directly led to suicides. They host Nazi content. They stream the uh, live stream the Christchurch shooting. Really fucking grim stuff. Um, talk about it. And Seth feared by journalists. Um, but they basically Kiwi Farms used to go for everyone, and they kind of pivoted to just go for trans people. And they have like a list of trans people they would go for. Um, they went for this lady, who's also known as Keffels on Twitter, Clara Sorrenti. Um, they swatted her, which is where you find someone's address, you dox them, and then you tell the police that there's a life hostage situation or something, and they send in people with big guns to storm into your house, and people die from this, because if someone just suddenly storms into your house, especially if you're in America and you have a gun, maybe you want to defend yourself, and then you get shot by the police. Um, this stuff uh, is fucking horrific. She stood up to Kiwi Farm, which is really, like, you know, Kevin is kind of controversial online, but mad respect for, have, for her for having the guts to stand up to this like horrific abuse, um, and got their uh, basically the people who are keeping them on the internet dropped them, and loads of other people dropped them, and the website is kind of dead now. It does keep kind of coming back a little bit, but. The further you push this out in the mainstream, the more this is deplatformed, the less people contribute to it, and this, regardless of whether you agree with deplatforming or not, it does work. Um, so, for example, Britain First, I don't know if you remember, anyone remembers Britain First from back in the day, like Brexit times, they used to have 1.8 million people on Facebook following them. And when they got kicked off Facebook, they went to Gab, which is like one of the Nazi Twitters, and now they have like 10,000 followers. Um, Milo Yiannopoulos is like a right-wing voice who says, and uh, he's doing the Kanye West tour at the moment. Um, he uh, he was complaining that he doesn't make any money anymore because he got deplatformed from all the big platforms, which means that he's just left with the weirdos who follow him on all the small ones, and they don't donate money. Um, Tommy Robinson, once he got banned from Twitter and Facebook, though I guess he's back on Twitter now, thanks Elon. Um, his rallies went from tens of thousands of people to hundreds, so it made a real world, real life difference. 
And kind of going arm in arm with that is defunding uh, these groups of people because they need money to act. I mean, lots of them are professional. Uh, there are professional gender critical people who just go around saying gender critical things and make money off it um, or do a huge crowdfunder and then disappear with the money. Oh, um, Scotland at least has one example. Um, but anyway, so there is examples of defun like defunding these people does make a difference as well. So the editor of Daily Mail was actually changed, like the Daily Mail admitted it in part due to Stop Funding Hate, which is a UK campaign group, getting all the advertisers pulled, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, also, the editor of the Express said that they were going to turn down the Islamophobia because of uh, Stop Funding Hate, though I think maybe they have a new editor now and they've turned it back up, but I don't know. Uh, GB News said that all their advertisers pulling out had really limited how outlandish they could be, which I think we all know what that means. And also, similarly, uh, Sleeping Giants, so like Stop Funding Hate for the US. Um, Steve Bannon said, so he's a Trump guy, I don't know if you've heard the name. I feel like doing this stuff means I know all these people's names, like I know all these fucking weirdos are. If you don't know, don't find out, it's, it's not worth it. But um, Sleeping Giants cost them 90% of their revenue in one year by just getting advertisers to stop advertising with them. So Richard Wilson, who's an organizer of Stop Funding Hate, said, uh, to me, I've been involved in campaigning for 20 years, but I've never seen a tactic that has made such a big impact as this, even when it's just like run by a group of volunteers. So this can make a difference. This is my last cat break, so yes, I'm just going to wrap up. Um, <clears throat> so what have we learned? We've learned that hate affects every trans person you know. Gender critical is a hate movement. They use dog whistles to hide what they're doing. Um, education can combat prejudice, and it makes a big difference. That's how we're going to win. The platform does work even if you don't like it, and cutting funding makes a big difference. Uh, last of all, love wins. Um, here's all my references. If you would like to see them, you can email me and I'll send them to you, um, which you can find on my website, katermontgomery.com. Here's Poppy's Instagram. And now <laughs> is my time to say thank you very much. If you have any questions, I hope you No matter what their Thanks. political views, um, so I don't endorse that for a second. Um, as you've probably guessed by now, as a gender critical person, I actually. Uh, sorry? Am I No, no, directly into it. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you might have turned off. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I think that there's probably three points I want to make you know, with a question kind of in that. Um, first of all, you, you, know, you challenged us to ask GC people what their views are. So I can tell you what mine are, and this isn't a dog whistle, you know, this really isn't, this is what I think. I, you, know, you, you have a few views up. I think that sex is dimorphic, it's fixed. I also think it's politically relevant. I think it has social and political consequences. And those consequences matter, they matter particularly to women, not only to women, but they do matter particularly to women's rights. And in order to protect women's rights, we need to have language that does that. We need to have the language to do it. We need to have clear concepts. 
Um, so yeah, that, that is basically what I think. Now that's not saying that trans identifying people don't have you rights do either. You want to ban trans women from women's toilets? Well, I don't want, I, please let me finish. But that is what you mean. Please will you, will you let me finish? I'll let you finish, but that is what you mean. What I mean is there need to be spaces that are single sex. Now I think what you, what you get to is a situation with a conflict of rights. So that a conflict of rights, some women need, because sex is relevant in a lot of women's lives, yes, gender identity is also relevant to some people. Sex isn't relevant to everybody, but a lot of, a lot of women it is. So what I think you need when you've got a conflict of rights and you've got some women who still need single sex toilets, and if you have trans women in that space, they're not single sex anymore. If you still need that, and you have some trans identifying people who are uncomfortable in the toilet associated with their sex, then you need a third space. You know, you, you need to think of it. That, that is what you just said, isn't it? Yeah, but it's, you're it's, just... So what I, what I think you should have it's are solutions. What, in the presentation. what I think you should you have, what I think we need are solutions that respect everybody's rights and give everybody, if not exactly what they want, if not exactly what they want, give everybody something that keeps them safe out of the solution they can live like with. Now, what I what you did with the WDI, I've just been um, having a quick scan through, it's quite long, as you know, the WDI declaration. It doesn't say the things you said. I hope people here will go and read it. Like, it. Well, uh, Shireen, Shireen, we, we need to coordinate this. <laughs> Katie, please, please, please. Okay, Shireen, you ask your question and that's it. Okay, okay. But, but I, to, to frame my question, what we've heard is a lot of, dis I think, a lot of distortions from the uh, declaration. There were a lot of things that are taken out of context and distorted, so I hope people here will read it. So Just what, please do. The, the, the question I want to ask is, yeah. Yeah. when conflicts of rights exist, to my mind, and you know, why we wanted to show the film that uh, we showed, we wanted to have genuine discussion because what I think needs to happen is people with diverse views who aren't going to agree on some things. In a liberal pluralist society, we have um, irreconcilable <laughs> views on lots of things. Yeah, sorry. No, no, I, I'm not allowing anything else. This is the last time, Shane. I want your question now. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to my question. No, 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 no. I want a question now. Okay, so my question is, would it not be more productive to try to find where we can seek commonalities and seek ways through the things we disagree We've with, rather than that. framing this as a hate movement who must never be heard and to whom you can never Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Katie. Yeah, I'm so I bored do. of hearing the No, 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 no
ruin trans people's lives. But there are lots of gender critical people who do, and if you're not ready to call them out, how can we have this discussion? How can we how can we even start it if you're not ready you. to Thank draw you. a line on the extremists? Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Coming around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a job. <laughs> My name is Kate Davison, I'm a lecturer in History of Sexuality here at Edinburgh. Um, new position just created this year, there are two of us, the other one just started last week, so please come and take our subject with us. Um, uh, I'm also a historian of sexual science and sexology and the history of conversion and aversion therapy, so that's my area of expertise. My question to Katie is why gender criticals and church never talk about trans men? I only talk about trans boys when talking about trans kids. Um, so you have this kind of dichotomy when talking about trans kids, they're always talking about confused lesbians. You know, every single trans man is just a poor, young, confused lesbian, um, even the ones who aren't attracted to women. Um, but when you get to adults, the only trans people they seem to talk about is the scary men in dresses. Um, and this, like, this, there's a reason, uh, there's a few reasons behind this, and I think it's what sells to the public. Um, it's very much, it, like, to sell fear of trans people, the best way to sell this kind of fear is a scary man in a dress suit, because, you know, they're selling this to men, the majority of people who are trans are men, most people of gender critical aligned views are men, and most people who support trans are women, so to sell this to these men, um, if they can sell this idea of, you know, someone's going to chase your wife down wearing a dress or whatever, um, it's scary. And also the idea of your sweet, innocent daughter being torn away from you and turned into this disgusting, you know, like, man, um, is, is a way of selling fear. But also it's just a way of, like, kind of reinforcing this patriarchal idea of trans men don't have their own agency because they're just women who are confused. Um, and yeah. so... You know, they're, oh, they're just silly, they're, they're, they don't know what they're doing, they don't know what they're doing. And, but trans women instantly have agency. From the moment they're just, you know, like, could be perceived as a man, so perhaps as like a 15 year old boy or something, maybe before they transition or maybe while they're transitioning, um, they then do have the agency and they can be blamed for their actions. Um, there was another point that I wanted to add. I think okay, I the question. question. Thank you. Don't make it an argument. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a slightly nested question, but it is directly inspired by what I've this today. If somebody wants to reach common ground with you, do you not believe that they would start the conversation with a question rather than a counter debate? And therefore, that led me to reflect more on one of the main things that gender critical people tend to weaponize, and that's their access to time and energy to debate certain topics in an academic style. Now, I'm at the stage now where I have heard it all before, but I know that to enter into such a debate would cost considerable time and energy and take us long past nine o'clock. So my question to you is, how do you deal with that kind of angle? So, um, I guess to your first part, um if someone wanted to find common ground with trans people, they wouldn't call us trans-identified persons. They wouldn't, they wouldn't describe our genitals as mutilated and, and all these other kinds of things, which are so dehumanizing. Like, it, in order to not deal with how dehumanizing this is, I just have to back away from it. Um, you know, it's one of the things that can get to me is when they talk about us like worse than animals. Um, just saw an article today from one of the hate groups uh, where they were saying like, oh, are, you know, trans people overblowing trans women committing suicide in men's prisons just for politics. And uh, so, and so, time and energy? No, 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 no. Yeah, 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 yeah. so that's just the, that's just one yeah. sort of first part. <laughs> yeah, no, um, but in the, in the time and energy thing, personally, uh, I am addicted to arguing, I kind of enjoy it, um, I feel like I, I'm very easily lured into it, and I have unlimited stamina for it. Okay, like, thank you. I could argue for it. Russian. Russian.
Hello. Um, so I am a trans man, which <laughs> I think it would be good to kind of expand on the different issues we have yeah. here. So very, very quickly, because I'm aware we don't have much time, they definitely talk about trans men. Um, I thought our comments are an absolute set of all the time, have them sexualize me, infantilize me. I think that's yeah. very interesting about the dynamic between trans men and trans women, because ultimately it's the same um, villain, if you will, the same fight, but very different <laughs> situations where trans women are you know, more demonized than trans women are infantilized. Um, and that kind of relates to other struggles as well. So I was wondering what you think about how the trans struggle kind of relates to other struggles that exist in the world, such as you know, anti-homelessness, anti-capitalism, anti-good health, wherever you stand on those issues, but how do they intersect? Yeah, so I guess with anything like this, it all intersects and it all adds up. And um, I, I don't want to see it as like, I, I, what I really don't like is oppression points where like, oh, you're a trans person, you have it bad, well, they're a trans person, and like, you know, a, a traveller, and so they have it twice as bad as you. That's just nonsense. That isn't a good way to look at this at all. And it's also rubbish to come say like, oh, you know, who has it worse? You know, do Asian people have it worse than gay people? Or like, that is another garbage way. But it's important to look at these struggles and see that they do intersect so that we don't, like, I think a really good example is from Bell Hooks, it's uh, one of her books, where she's talking about how there was the feminist movement and there was the black rights movement. And the feminist movement only really cared about white women and the black movement only really cared about black men. So where did black women have to go? Because whenever they went to the black rights movement, there was misogyny. And whenever they went to the feminist movement, racism was tolerated. So we need to be intersectional to understand this stuff happens so we can listen to these groups. Um, but just to say quick, very quickly how this like, intersects, there are some things like for example, travellers' rights, which I'm quite ignorant of, um, which don't, um, they aren't necessarily part of the same force so explicitly in my mind, and perhaps travellers would disagree, and if so, I would love to hear. But in terms of like, gay rights, trans rights are obviously super tied. Uh, and also women's rights, all three of these are, you know, part of patriarchy's um, attempt to control people and get them to fit into strict boxes, to get sex to be a binary thing and it can't change, so that there's a clear hierarchy. Okay, Katie, online questions. Okay. Today is the Holocaust Memorial Day, with several more panics, trade union under threat, and with Section 35 impacting democracy. Are we seeing fascism and race again in the UK? Yeah, I, I think um, we have been heading that way. I do feel like the Boris Johnson government was heading that way. I feel like it was our version of the Trump government. I, you know, the Trump government was definitely fascism. Um, when British people do things, they do it compared to Americans are much more subtly. Um, but sometimes that can be more insidious and sometimes less. Like I was saying, people who don't say their views out loud are kind of can be more dangerous. Um, I don't know with this current government. I do feel like I'm hoping that we're going to have you know, a, a sort of swing to the left reaction, a bit like the USA has had. But like, fascism is definitely, uh, the, the Overton window has shifted. If you, the Overton window is like the range of acceptable political positions, and saying fascist things is now much more accepted than it would have been in the So, J.K. Um, Rowling is a huge donor of this university. How do you feel about speaking at university who supports us? J.K. Rowling. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, donating to education is good. So, I'm glad she doesn't just hold all of her wealth. Um, so, you know, I'm glad that I'm able to talk here, and, that, and that's good. I'm, I'm not really going to thank her for it. I don't really feel like it's a conflict or anything. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really have an issue with it. I think you need to approach at the end because this is the time for us. We're finishing. Cathy, thank you very much for being tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For having me.